Welcome everyone to our Digital Contracting for Net Zero series, where we explore with leaders in the field how legal teams are jumping into action to support corporate climate ambition. Today, I'm joined by Jessica Mattel and Tara Fontanilla to show how in-house and private practice lawyers are teaming to support net zero across fast-moving consumer goods supply chains through net zero aligned contracting and explore the growing importance of technology in this space. Jessica is a partner at Allens in the Allens TMT team based in Sydney. Prior to joining Allens, Jess spent five years practicing in New York. Jess acts for clients across all sectors on critical supply chain arrangements, complex commercial transactions, technology innovation and telecommunications projects and commercial data matters. Tara is a lawyer and business professional with over 20 years experience spanning public and private sectors. Tara is Senior Legal Counsel NZ with Danone Oceania. Prior to joining Danone, Tara practiced as a strategic procurement professional. Her purpose is to have the greatest positive impact on as many people as possible. So we can see why you're working on net zero. Thanks, Tara. Welcome, Tara and Jess. Thank you. Thanks, Natalia. Okay. Um, so to kick off, Tara, can we start with you, please? Could you tell us a bit about Danone and its approach to environmental net zero? Um, let's start there and then I'd love to hear more about how you're working with your legal advisors in this space, in particular on contracting for net zero. Handing over to you, Tara. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, if um, if you, I think the known as synonymous with yogurt in a lot of, um, in a lot of countries, um, I think in Australia and New Zealand, um, we are well known for our products in um, yogurt products, Evian in the water space, and Caracare Care and Aptamil in terms of infant nutrition. Um, we are a global multinational company. And I think one of the things that sets Danone apart is the fact that our vision at Danone is about one planet, one health focus. So rather than looking at a singular focus on environmental net zero, Danone's approach has always been more holistic. Our vision called One Planet, One Health is a belief that the health of people and the health of the planet are interconnected. We see it as our responsibility to protect both. To us, sustainability must include not only social and economic impacts, but also the environmental impacts. To us, it has to be a win-win-win, a win for the planet, a win for the people, and a win for business. One of the things that's really important to us is to become one of one of um, multinationals that become B Corp certified by 2025. That's our ambition. Um, if you don't know about B Corps, they are leaders of a global movement of people that use business as a force for good. Um, we aspire to use the power of a business to solve both social and environmental problems. A B Corp certification is a mark of trust. It's a promise that a company is doing business in a way that meets rigorous standards of social and environmental performance, transparency, and accountability. B Lab is a third party nonprofit that certifies it. And in order for a B, uh, an organization to get B Corp certifi certified, a company must complete a B impact assessment and earn at least 80 out of 200 possible points. And to have to recertify um, every three years with the aim of continuously improving. Now, our entity, I'm proud to say in Oceania, was certified as B Corp in March 2022. So we are one of many firms within the Danone umbrella that have recently reached that B Corp status. As of today, 70% of the known global sales are covered by that B Corp certification. So we're really proud of that. Um, the other thing that I guess is different at Danone is we are an entreprise a mission, which is um, a in um, French law, a company whose objectives um, includes both social, societal, and environmental um, fields as aligned with its purpose and set out its bylaws. So not only do um, we talk the talk, we walk the walk in what we need to do um, look internally as well. Now, if I just go on to your um, question around environmental net zero, Natalia, one of the things that we focus on under our One Planet banner 
is um, fighting climate change, promoting regenerative agriculture, protecting our water cycles, and co-building a circular economy of packaging. And in order to do that, obviously, the um, um, we need to have those ambitions and have a way of actually executing on those, those ambitions. Under climate, um, our ambition is to reach net, net zero emissions on our full value chain by 2050. Under regenerative agriculture, it's about fostering practices that protect our soils, promote animal welfare, and empower a new generation of farmers. Under water, we protect and value water as an essential resource for both local communities and Danone. And in terms of our circular economy, our aim is to make our packaging 100% recyclable, compostable, or reusable by 2025. Now, these ambitions are backed up by how we procure um, engagements with suppliers, the type of um, capex and operational strategic projects we enter into, because just having a promise without a plan to execute doesn't get you very far. So locally, as, a, as an example of what we've done in um, the climate side of things is within New Zealand, we have commissioned the largest biomass boiler in the New Zealand dairy industry, where we use sustainable wood as fuel, right? It's a $30 million investment in sustainability that what it means is that once that boiler is fully operational, it reduces our factory's carbon emission by 20,000 tons of carbon dioxide each year. Now, together with our switch to certified green energy, that means it will reduce our, our carbon emissions at, fact, at the factory by 95%, which means it will enable us to reach carbon neutrality by 2023. Now, that's a big milestone for us at the known Oceania. Yeah, 2023 is just around the corner, right? <laughs> it's next year. So these are these are grand ambitions. And I'm I'm curious around how the legal team has been involved um, in renegotiating, whether it be um, at renewal time or in um, you know RFP processes. Uh, how absolutely. are you how are you incorporating net zero ambitions within your contractual arrangements? Um, it starts off from, you know, the DNA that runs through the culture of the company to what we actually put in as um, clauses that we can act on within our contractual framework. So in every single supplier engagement at the known, we have our suppliers sign on to our sustainable code of conduct um, for business partners. And in circumstances where a counterparty has their own version of that, we make sure that there is consensus between the two. So these are these are things that have targets to them and we attach audit rights to it. But more importantly, we actually attach breach rights um, to these sustainability clauses as well. And the known is not afraid to actually um, enforce those rights should we need be. But we always start at the choice of project. We always start at the choice of partner. And we make sure that whenever we're sourcing, we are choosing partners who are walking the same, um, I guess, trodden ground that we are going on as well. Yeah, fantastic. I, I suspect there'll be um, an educative process in a in in that process of um, you know incorporating various provisions. Have you had to take a, a lighter approach? To, I mean, despite the fact that you vet your suppliers beforehand to make sure your values are aligned, do you feel when it comes to the negotiation table that um, some lawyers sort of ill equipped to be able to negotiate clauses? Do you take a lighter approach up front with a view to ramping up downstream? I'm really curious about that. And is it like do you do mainly use carrots or sticks? Wait, I mean, um, we, you, yeah, thanks, Natalia. We, I mean, we definitely take an educational approach just because I think, you know, um, the One Planet, One Health sort of vision is, has been part of the known DNA since the 1970s. We don't expect all other suppliers or other entities out there to be as advanced in the journey as we are in. And, you know, having, I guess, um, 
equal investments in the type of things that we are choosing to invest in. So whenever we have these discussions, it's always about continuous improvement, right? It's always making suppliers and counterparties aware of why these things are important to us. And of course, it's always about um, choosing the categories with the greatest impact. You know, you don't boil yeah. the ocean, you know, you boil a cup at a time. So yeah. it is about making sure that whenever we're engaging, we're looking at the best, uh, the, the, the impact that we're generating, right? Well, how do you measure that? How do you measure the impact? Do you have any tips? Because, you know, any in-house team, we're thinking, where do we start there? You know, do we start with, um, you know, look at the highest, um, you know, the, the, do you go by industry? Um, do you go by, you know, type of contract? So where do you feel you can drive, given given where you are in your sector, where, what type of contracts would you focus on up front to deliver the greatest impact on net zero? Absolutely. So for us, it's where we look at our own, production and look at where our um, our greatest source of wastes are and where the, the greatest opportunities are. And that's where we that's when we identify from a procurement category perspective, which ones do we prioritize? So for example, um, the biomass boiler at our production site in Bakuda, which you know dries um, liquid milk to make that powder, it's a energy intensive exercise that today would either rely on LPG or in the past would rely on coal, you know, dirty fuel. So mm -hmm. we knew that um, in order to get bang for buck and to, or in order to get the biggest amount of impact, we needed to address that. You know, we are in an uh, energy intensive industry, but mm -hmm. how do we do that? That actually focuses on the planet and the people as well, as well as delivering our business outcomes. And that's why, you know, we went all in, invested in sustainability in that space. And, you know, hopefully touch wood by, by the end of 2023, um, we reach carbon neutrality. We're excited about it, you know, and it has been a long road because you've, you've, it's a multiple multi-supplier enterprise, right? And you have to take them on board, right? And so there's, there's a lot about the, the procurement cycle that um, that's involved in terms of our making sure that uh, suppliers are clear or participants to our um, tenders are clear on our requirements, and then making sure that across the board um, towards that you know whole um, sales cycle to the execution cycle that's carried along the way, right? And of course we make sure that there are SLAs, right? Because it's not. Yeah. It's not about just signing the contract. It's about operationalizing the contract once it's up yeah. and running. Yeah. Can we get back to you on that, Jess? The Tara, I'd really like to explore that and unpack that a little bit more around the data and the capture and the technology. But before we do that, Jess, I'd like to flip to you, please. Could you please could you explain what you're seeing in the market in amongst Australian corporates on net zero? Um, and in particular, how procurement and legal teams are tackling net zero. Um, and then we'll come back to technology and data a little yeah. bit later. Absolutely fantastic. I mean, it's great to hear from Tara sort of the way this is playing out in practical terms at Danone because it just sort of it, it, it gives context to what, what we're seeing in, in the private practice world as well. So, I mean, as, as a tech and procurement lawyer, I'm really seeing our clients tackling their net zero targets in, in two main ways. So the first is our clients are increasingly using the procurement process as the, the mechanism by which they can deliver on their environmental objectives, um, particularly as you know, most of an organization's environmental footprint or emissions, it actually falls outside of their direct operations. So if you can make that impact through your supply chain, you can actually have a, a really major impact on your overall sort of environmental output. Um, and, and then secondly, our clients are very focused, as we touched on Natalia, on, on collection and use of data regarding their emissions and those of their supply chain and, and finding new ways to leverage um, technology tools and analytics for tracing and, and tracking and understanding that data. Um, maybe to dive in a little bit more on, on that procurement side of things which you asked about, I think it's really important to view it holistically and, and the way that um, those decarbonisation priorities can be achieved through all aspects of the contract life cycle. So, you know, the contract life cycle starts at the RFP stage, request for proposal, 
where you've got a new procurement kicking off. At that stage, our clients are usually focused on setting requirements or benchmarks in their RFP to make sure that there's sort of a clear criteria from a emissions perspective of what you know what those minimum expectations are of suppliers mm -hmm. um, something that we often encourage is um, and, you know it varies from deal to deal um, and industry to industry but um, trying to be you know to make sure that we're not being too prescriptive about what this solution is but rather setting out what is the objective what is the ultimate goal that we're working towards and then leaving it up to um, to the industry and to the suppliers to be able to put forward proposals to achieve that. And so I think if you're um, a little more open-ended with those RFP requirements, it often can result in greater creativity in the solutions that get put back to you by your prospective suppliers. And then obviously, as you move through that process, you know, the next phase is down selection. I think it's really critical to make sure that you're actually putting weight on those environmental uh, requirements. So Tara sort of touched on this before, making sure that you're not just paying lip service to it, but actually uh, when the rubber hits the road, you're not just down selecting based <coughs> on the provider necessarily, but actually giving some real meaningful weight to those, um, those green solutions. Um, and then of course, the other element of the RFP stage is supply chain due diligence. So we've seen a lot of supply chain due diligence but for some time, particularly on the S in ESG, you know, the social side of things, modern slavery. Um, and, and I think the scope of that due diligence is really increasing on the environmental side now as well and making sure there's a clear understanding of um, the way that your supplier is operating and the impact that, that their own supply chain is having from an emissions perspective. So that's the RFP stage. Um, I guess then you move to your contracting stage. So it's critical to make sure your contract has the mechanisms that you need so that there's, there's teeth to those requirements. Um, we, you know, there are hard law requirements around some of these issues, but, but I think at least at the moment, they certainly fall short of what stakeholder expectations are. And so I think it's important to make sure that your contract isn't just meeting those really bare bones, hard law, current hard law requirements, but actually, you know, imposing higher higher objectives that align with what your organization wants to achieve um, and then the other element is making sure that there's some flexibility there too because the laws are changing and the expectations are changing and so particularly for any contract that runs for you know a number of years you want to make sure that there's some flexibility to actually uplift those requirements yes. so that um you know your arrangement doesn't effectively look good at signing but become stale and, and out of date um, so, you know, there are a number of ways that's being achieved. I, I think you may have discussed all, uh, the Chancery Lane project in one of your other webinars. So there's a lot, you know, there are a number of projects to, to create model clauses on the environmental front, which can be leveraged. And I think as time goes on, we're, we're going to see a greater uniformity in the market and, you know, and a better understanding of what is typical and what is market on that front, because it is currently a little disparate and, and tends to vary from industry to industry. Um, but, but one of the other things we're seeing that's really interesting is um, how some of your traditional contractual remedies and, and clauses can be leveraged for, you know, the, the environmental objective purpose that, that may not have been used that way in the past. So uh, Tara mentioned audit. That's a really good one. You know, you may have previously only used your audit clauses for um, health and safety perspective or, or for pricing perspectives, um, whereas now that can actually be used to make sure that um, environmental performance is where you expect it to be or emissions are, you know, what, what is being reported. Similarly, benchmarking is another one. You know, benchmarking is a mechanism that's historically been used for pricing. Um, but now, particularly as organisations increasingly publish their emissions uh, information and, and will be required to do so at law, um, that information will be readily available. So being able to use your benchmarking rights um, to, to sort of assess your suppliers on that basis as well um, is sort of another interesting thing we're playing out. And then, of course, um, as Tara touched on as well, termination rights and, and making sure that you actually have those remedies and that recourse to, to, um, to have some teeth in the contract if, if things aren't going the way that you expect. So um, I guess just to close that loop on the, the contract life cycle, um, you know, the, the contract doesn't end at the point at which it's signed. Um, and vendor management is really critical from an ESG perspective, as well as just a, a general business perspective as well. So, um, I mean, it's important that businesses are not just setting and forgetting under their contracts, uh, particularly because the market and stakeholders, you know, shareholders, customers, 
will hold customers, uh, sorry, will hold companies to account um, if they aren't actually holding true to their public statements around what they're doing on the emissions and the environmental front generally. So having a code of conduct that everyone sort of puts in a drawer and ignores, that's not workable anymore. It might, you might have got away with that a few years ago, mm -hmm. but these days um, it's really important to be using those vendor management tools in your contract, continuous improvement, reporting, um, that sort of thing to, to make sure that uh, your ESG objectives are, are being met. Um, and then, you know, from for your really long-term contracts, making sure that those levers that I spoke about before for uplifting are also being utilised or, or otherwise even just your change management regime to make sure that your contracts are remaining sort of best in market from uh, the environmental perspective as well. So I'll, I'll pause there. Thanks, Jess. Before we move on to data and technology, can we please just focus on any particularly creative provisions that you've seen from suppliers in relation to net zero? Um, so, I mean, I think often uh, the creativity is maybe more on the, the customer side because they're the ones who are wanting to make sure that the, that their objectives are being met. You know, the suppliers aren't necessarily volunteering up um, obligations on themselves uh, to meet environmental objectives. I think I think that where I'm seeing the creativity playing out the most is actually on the incentives. You know, particularly things things like pricing and and trying to make sure that there are mutual incentives for both parties to try and achieve these objectives. So things like um, cost savings that are achieved through the use of technology that, that has an environmental objective being able to be shared or IP that's developed in connection with um, improved environmental practices, that IP being jointly commercialised or able to be used by the supplier or other commercial arrangements to, to offset some of those costs. So I think trying to, trying to make sure that those commercial incentives are there for both parties as opposed to having a real... Um, just I think carrot and stick as you mentioned before sort of making sure both parties are driven to, to achieve that outcome that's probably where I'm seeing um, the, the creativity play out. Fantastic so now you, you mentioned data this is a big issue with the firms that I've spoken to about net zero and the legal function um, and especially of course when we're talking about you know the ongoing vendor management the relationship management the obligation management how is that playing out? Because, you know, gone are the days where we're sort of exchanging emails or maybe that's what's happening is that that is a very inefficient way of sharing data across supply chains. Could you please talk a bit about what you're seeing in the market and what you see happening in the future? Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, it's it's interesting. Tech and data is, is definitely being used as one of the key solutions um, by organisations to tackle net zero goals. Um, the ways in which you know it's important. Firstly, I think it's really critical to have a clear picture of what your emissions are. So, in other words, like a baseline, so that you can then design an improvement program. So, being able to collect that data across your own organisation um, and then your suppliers is really important. And, and that's a that's historically been a very manual process um, and not something that's necessarily um, easy to do accurately. Um, without leveraging tech and data tools. So that's one of the ways that we're seeing tech and data being used is, is to automate that collection of data. Um, and particularly as ESG reporting obligations increase, that process of collecting and calculating emissions data becomes really onerous and, and the risk of providing inaccurate data becomes even more material because you're now mm -hmm. trying to meet the regulatory obligations. So we're seeing the use of uh, technology tools, particularly things like um, Internet of Things devices, so smart meters and, and sensors, that things that can collect and, and capture data in real time and then feed it back to an organisation. So, you know, how, how far has your delivery truck travelled? How long was it idle for? How much water was used in this particular cooling process, et cetera? Um, and then taking it one step further, some of the really clever or you know, forward thinking organisations are making sure that they're collecting the exact data they need from those sensors for their ESG reporting. So it can actually be fed directly from IoT device through the report, taking out all of the manual processing, um, which is not only you know, really a, much more efficient, but it also then ticks your G in the ESG, the, the governance, because suddenly your data is it's auditable, it's verifiable, it's transparent. Um, so there's that sort of added component as well. 
Um, and, and it sort of lastly goes without saying, I think that ESG data is really just operational data. So finding those efficiencies through your data analytics and, and capturing and, and understanding the way your, your assets are operating, it not only reduces your emissions, but it's effectively saving time and cost and allowing for other business insights um, which have, you know, a, a benefit aside from the environmental impact. So, um, so you know, we're, we're frequently advising clients on, on that development and adoption and, and, and use of technology. Um, and, and I guess actually that just to finish, as the use cases for technology are growing, the other thing that we're seeing is a lot of collaboration between government and private sector, between large organisation and, and tech startup. Um, a, a lot of collaborations with universities and academia um, and even, you know, we're, we're permissible between competitors to try and um, develop or find new ways to leverage those, those technologies um, to, to achieve these outcomes and, and potentially even to generate new revenue streams through commercialising those technologies themselves. Wow, that's so exciting. Um, Tara, maybe I'll just get back to you. So we, we touched on technology and data. Um, could you talk to how Danone is leveraging technology and data to support net zero? Yeah, it's it's um, all over the whole production site. So and so I, I speak a lot about production because um, New Zealand's preliminarily, um, preliminarily a supply point um, to Oceania. Um, and the rest of the world in terms of the products that we create here. And when you're talking about factory, you're talking about um, production efficiencies. So, you know, we have a dashboards across across the um, across the board that actually measures productivity, you know, die you know, delivery on time, delivery in full and on time, um, and to make sure that we're making the most of the resource and not creating waste along the way, because not only is it um, expensive, it's also, you know, that potentially is wasted resource that can't be redeployed to something else. So it's all about um, effectiveness and efficiency. And in order to be able to continuously improve in that space, you need to be able to have a way of measuring it in order to manage it. So across the whole supply chain, um, whether it be having, you know, um, AI to, you know, to scan bags to make sure that we are um, using the right input ingredients to a particular brand, blend of finished goods, um, that's in place. Whether it means having um, a paperless system on the production side to enable the teams to communicate each other for, uh, with each other from shift to shift, you know, that's something that's enabled um, to, to making sure that we're partnering with like Jess said, you know, um, universities or, um, um, you know, new tech company startups in order for them to actually, you know, run a pilot for us in how we would use a certain piece of technology more and commercialize the outputs of that for us. You know, that's something that the known is open to and has been known um, to embed in its supply chain because it's, it's not a place where we can remain static and a lot of our problems are complex and having to use the modern ways of um, dealing with those problems allows us um, to have another way of um, potentially dealing with a complex problem, right? I'm curious, this is a sneaky one. With um, legal teams, in-house legal teams, are KPIs being developed specifically around net zero? within our own legal team or within yeah, or generally well. have you no, so, that, so, so where things are going yeah absolutely so um within within the known we have what we call a nature pillar and by being an enterprise mission um our governance um our governance across the known includes sustainability targets so it cascades from the ceo up to all down to all the employees so that as part of what you do and how you do you do your day job, there's a nature component, right? So it's part of our KPI. So definitely, and in terms of incentives for executives, being able to deliver on um, our one planet ambitions is very important. 
Thank you. Thank you, Tara. Just a quick ending question for you both. Um, tips for newcomers to the space. So lawyers that want to make a difference either in private practice or in in-house roles, legal roles, um, where do you, where should they start? Like how should they embrace net zero? Any tips in this in this space will be appreciated. I think for me, um, I think a lot of people are sometimes confused by the language and sometimes it's the the problem seems so big that it is overwhelming but i think if you um just look at what you do at work versus what you do at home and you, if you think about the procurement hat that you put at work it's the same when you buy things at home you know um it's you know when you go to the grocery store you have to ask yourself do you need it knowing what's already in the fridge you still have to buy that second tin of baked beans when you know you probably have a stock of it at home. Um, it's choosing less packaging in what you buy. It's going, well, should buy, I bring my own Tupperware container to a particular store, you know, so that I am not consuming that. It's taking, it's actually taking those practices that are very common to what you do day to day and at home and actually applying that to what you do to work. And then I think that opens up the opportunities that are already available. Because I think sometimes the problem might seem too hard yes. at an operational level, but in reality, it's common sense and we do it day to day, right? So I think that would be my first tip, but also I think the second that goes, um, you know, quite close to the heels of that is, just encourage that culture right within your organization because i think that's what enables um people to execute you know you don't need to convince people if you're speaking to the choir right you're preaching to them already um and it it makes execution a lot easier yeah, yeah I, I think also the individual absolutely yeah I, I, I think they're fantastic tips um i guess from my perspective, I think this, given the size of the problem and, and also, you know, the, the nature of trying to address it from a legal perspective, it really requires uh, cross-functional collaborative teams. Mm -hmm. So I think on the private practice side, certainly partnering up across practice groups, that, that's the approach we take at Allen's. You know, it's not just a technology and procurement issue. It's not just a litigation issue. It's not just an environmental uh, regulatory issue really it requires a, a full service team to, to try and think about these things and similarly I see um, with our clients with Danone with others um, it requires cross-functional teams legal working really closely with procurement and business and the compliance side of things to make sure that everyone is on the same page and and driving those solutions together so I think um, like, like many things um, teamwork is, is pretty critical to, to trying to drive these things forward. Are you enjoying that, by the way? I mean, it's different languages, right? In in sort of technology fields, in procurement. Um, I think this is a really wonderful opportunity for, for lawyers to, to sort of think more broadly around the problems they're solving um, within, within Australian corporates. So I just want to say, um, Jess and Tara, I love your work. Thank you for joining today and sharing your experience and insights. Kofi Annan. Our biggest challenge in this new century is to take an idea that seems abstract, sustainable development, and turn it into a reality for all of the world's people. Thank you, Jess and Tara, for your leadership in making sustainable development a reality, one contract at a time. I'm Natalia Sunomarkovic, fellow with the Centre for Legal Innovation. Till next time.